Hello, Namaskar. Good evening, respected members and guests. Today, we are going to organize the first ever an international talk on a very special topic organized by Sunlit Studio Film Club, Assam, India. The topic is Pitching Documentary to the Mass, the Concept of the Real, by Dr. Sabir Hawk from UAE. It's our privilege and honor that Dr. Sabir Hawk has given us his consent to speak on such a lovely and wonderful topic. I would like to give you a brief idea about Sunlit Studio Film Club. This film club is founded by Partujit Borua and Dr. Ananya Hilodori, with the veteran filmmaker Orup Manna as the chief advisor of this film club. Its primary intention is to create good audience and provide a platform for the young filmmakers as well as young film critics to understand cinema as a work of art. Moreover, it will provide limited financial support to the young filmmakers to make short fiction films. We're immensely happy to say that members of this film club are from different parts of the country and also from abroad. They are veteran filmmakers, award-winning filmmakers, film scholars, film critics, professors, professional artists, university students, media students, actors, producers, theater personalities, and cinephiles. Now, I'd like to request Dr. Haruki Horali, Professor, Department of Communication and Journalism, Gohati University, to give a brief bio note on our resource person, Dr. Sabir Hawk. Over to Dr. Haruki Horali. Thank you, Thank you Pathada. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Sabir Hawk. Dr. Hawk is a multifaceted academician with over 15 years of experience in academics, broadcast media, and filmmaking. He finished his master's in mass communication from Mass Communication Research Center, Jamia Millia Islamia, India, in 2003. He completed his PhD in journalism and social media from School of Communication, Manipal University, India, in 2017. His first documentary film, Fistful of Steel, in 2003, begged the National Award for Environment and Wildlife Conservation, which was screened at various film festivals worldwide. He joined NDTV, a premier TV news channel in India, and later NDTV Arabia in the UAE. He continues to direct documentary films and has built up a strong industry profile, creating films for corporates and government UAE agencies. He presently teaches broadcast media and new media technologies at School of Arts and Sciences, American University of Ras Al Khaimah. He is a certified avid media composer, instructor, and creates online training materials for film production, graphic design and layout, web technologies, and social media advertising. We are very happy to have you, sir, amongst us in this forum. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much. Um, I have to first give my gratitude to Bhattajidda for giving me this opportunity. I was very thrilled when he uh, gave me this opportunity. And the first topic that I had to go for is documentary films. Um, although because of my academic uh, pursuits for my PhD, I moved on to other disciplines uh, like television production and uh, new media technologies and journalism. But documentary is something which has always been uh, an area that I wanted to excel myself as a practitioner, as a filmmaker. At the same time, I take, take deep interest in understanding what is happening in that area. And whenever I watch a new documentary film, um, I watch a lot of documentary films. Uh, I just want to ensure where does the documentary falls into in, in what can be the discussion if we have to talk about that documentary in particular. So documentary as an area has always been my primary interest. So when I got this opportunity, I wanted to, because I know the people who are attending the session are either film students who are interested in film studies, but there could be also students who wants to be aspiring filmmakers. So keeping that wide uh, you know, uh, audience in mind, I have devised this particular lecture. So I would like to get into my 
PowerPoint slides so that I can take you through what I have planned for you. So let me get into the PowerPoint slide right now. As you can see, I work as an assistant professor at American University of Russell Kemmer, that's in, that's in the UAE. And what is the key aspect of today's lecture? The first aspect is, I want to question, does documentary has the capacity to reach to the masses? What do you think about it? Does the answer, if the answer is no, the documentary does not have a mass media appeal, has it got to do with its very definition itself? Maybe we are defining it wrongly. And third, for any documentary to be successful, when I say successful, I mean in its, in its reception, in its commercial success. Ask yourself this question. Have you ever been to a theater? I mean, I know last two years has been difficult to get into a theater. It's, it's also dangerous to get into a theater in the last two years. But in general, ask yourself this question. How many times has a documentary been released on a theater near you? How many times have you gone to watch a documentary in a theater? So is it because documentary provides a very direct, raw, unmediated access to its characters and the stories that it aims to tell? Is that why it becomes a successful documentary? Or is it something opposite entirely? So what this session aims to question is it wants to question this concept, this idea of the real. I want to sow doubts in the very definition of documentary. And I would love to take you on a, into a world of Errol Morris. Uh, and uh, can you all see my slide? Yes. Yes. Perfect. OK, thank you so much. So I want to explore the world of Errol Morris and also through him try to question this whole idea of what is real. How do you define real? And ultimately, I think through that questioning, we will get an answer to the question that I want to ask, which is, how do you pitch a documentary to the masses? And how do you think it should succeed, it would succeed? And I'm going to give you some of my own thoughts in that area. Now, moving on, I will come back to Errol Morris a little later. But before I go ahead, I want to tell you a trivia. Errol Morris broke into the scene with his 1988 film called The Thin Blue Line. It was rejected for the best documentary Oscar nomination because of its stylized reenactments of, digit, of disputed events. So to give you a quick idea of what this documentary was about, this documentary. So by the way, Errol Morris started his career as a lawyer. He was interviewing convicts, convicts who, were, who were about to be executed. In his interview with one of the convicts, he realized that something is wrong. And he interviewed the person on camera, of course. And that interview with the accused and the non-accused ultimately led to this person's release. And how did they tell the story? They were talking heads and they were reenactments. So what happened on the night of the shooting is what you see in the film again and again and again. So the entire documentary is filled with reenactments. Of course, the people from the academy were not able to understand. We're not able to put, docu put Errol Morris' thin blue line within the definition of documentary. After the first few couple of minutes into the film, one of the members said, this is not a documentary. So most of the pioneers that Errol Morris have you know, most of the techniques that Errol Morris have pioneered over the course of his career now for over 40 years now, there's so much to cover. And so much he has added to this very definition of documentary that we want to question. You know, you think that you know what documentary is because you might have seen some TV programs which are labeled as documentary. And you think, OK, a documentary needs to be an objective journalistic presentation of social problems. You might have seen a historical program, something like Ken Burns. You know, Ken Burns is known for his documentary or historical documentaries. And those are something that is, comes on TV very often, on PBS, for example. So my, you might have seen a do historical documentary and, and might have understood, OK, if that's how documentary is, so that's how documentary's definition should be. 
if you talk about today, if you like find lots of portraits of historical figures and important figures, and you see those programs being telecast on television, and you think, okay, that's the definition of documentary. So our definition is based on also the trust comes. So for example, if I see a documentary on BBC, I will assume, okay, this must be trustworthy. Why? Because it has certain elements. Elements like it has a heavy baritone voice as a voiceover. You know, like Morgan Freeman, if you have, I'm sure you're familiar with Morgan Freeman, the voice of God. When he speaks, people listen. And then when he speaks and he gives you something about any facts, you would listen because that's Morgan Freeman speaking to you. And that's our definition of documentary, right? We trust a particular form because we see it more often on television. And we think, OK, that's, that's where documentary is. I want to show you a clip. And I want you to listen to it also carefully. And tell me, would you trust BBC with this particular feature that they released? It's a long time back. So let me take me out of the scene and let me go straight to the, to the video. It's about harvesting spaghetti. It isn't only in Britain that spring this year has taken everyone by surprise. Here in the Ticino, on the borders of Switzerland and Italy, the slopes overlooking Lake Lugano have already burst into flower, at least a fortnight earlier than usual. But what, you may ask, has the early and welcome arrival of bees and blossom to do with food? Well, it's simply that the past winter, one of the mildest in living memory, has had its effect in other ways as well. Most important of all, it's resulted in an exceptionally heavy spaghetti crop. The last two weeks of March are an anxious time for the spaghetti farmer. I mean, can There's you imagine? There's always the chance of a late frost, which, while like, not entirely it's a ruining the crop, it's a feature of how spaghetti is being harvested. And makes it difficult for him to obtain and this is the time, by the way, where market. people were not familiar with this particular dish, with, with this particular food item. So sport. it's a hoax video. This is probably the best hoax here video we've seen ever not, of course, carried on out on anything telly. like the tremendous scale of okay. the Italian. So I'm going to crash out of it. Many of you, but you I'm get sure, the will have seen pictures of this the documentary is treated, this feature is treated like a documentary. For the Swiss, that is however, why it is so it believable. To be more of a family affair. Right? Because it has Another all the elements and all the features bumped. that makes you believe in what documentary is. Right? So we unconsciously believe in this conceit of the real. What you see in, in, in front of you is the first documentary ever termed as a documentary. It's called The Nanook of the Knot, and it is, it is directed by Robert Flaherty. I'm sure if you're a film student, you would have heard about this film. What is interesting about this film is when Robert Flaherty was making this film back in 1915. And remember, in those days, we don't have fancy cameras, small cameras, very heavy film cameras. He has to carry it to the optic. Okay, so you have to run those cameras in those really cold conditions. It's not easy. It needs a lot of light. It has lots of problems. It's not so like you pick up a camera and you pick up a phone and start filming. And that's how we do today. In those days, 1915, things were difficult. And things, the, the film also used to catch fire also quite, quite often. So when he returned after shooting for many months, he came back to Toronto, 30,000 feet of his negative caught fire. And he had to go back to shoot. So when he went back to shoot, he knew, he knew the people, people knew him. The people that who were his subjects knew him. So it became obviously much easier. And he thought to himself, you know, he faced all those problems with lighting. How do you shoot inside an igloo? It's too dark. It's too dark for the camera. How do you deal with the problem? You cut out the igloo. <laughs> you have only a, a, a half part of the roof, right? And you shoot. And it looks like as if you are inside the igloo and the lighting is <laughs> fine. But that's not true. It's not the truth. The, there is no roof. It is only half a roof. And you're shooting inside how Eskimos live inside the igloo. And you know, so that's what he did. He made his film possible because he had to make some compromises. Right? He told the people who the key characters to act before the camera. So certain scenes are all acted, which means these are reenactments, isn't it? These are real actors, but these are reenactments. Re like they're living their life the way they live their life. I want to make a documentary on your life, and I want to bring a camera to your house, and I want to shoot you, and I want to make sure that you show the way you live your life. You're reenacting re for the camera. Where is the real? Now, I'll bring you back to the question that uh, Errol Morris' film was rejected by, by the, the Academy for too many reenactments. 
Well, what is this? This is the very definition of documentary that we know of. For the subjects, it was like, oh, you know what? He's coming all the way. He's making a film on our life. You know, tomorrow our kids, our, our you know, under generation will not be will not be doing the same thing we're doing. It will become a documentation for them. What happened finally? The film was received with a resounding success. While people were queuing up outside the theaters to watch the film, the audience were watching the film while the subject died hungry on a hunting trip in the Arctic. Right? So that definition of the documentary that we know of over the years, because of better technology, because of smaller cameras, people tried to bring in more realism in the films. And that's why we talk about cinema verite and direct cinema. Direct cinema is also known as observational cinema. So uh, we're going to talk about both. Let's talk about cinema verite first. So cinema verite comes from a French filmmaker. Jean Roach, and he was the first filmmaker who kind of wanted to make truthful cinema. Like we obviously talk about, we can talk about Ziga Vertov and you know the film, the camera truth. But uh, Jean Roach was approaching a particular this whole aspect of documentary filmmaking with a new, uh, you know, uh, new set of rules. The earlier filmmakers who adopted this style were uh, Dia Pennebecker and Richard, Richard Leacock and Robert Drew. And this kind of film, like Cinema Verite, is called observational cinema. If you talk about different forms of documentary, uh, you talk about Cinema Verite as an observational cinema. There's also direct cinema. You know, we'll look into the, into, into the differences, the fine line between them. So what did he do? He wanted to avoid the, the newsreel style, the style that you're used to. Like when you watch documentaries like a newsreel, you know, there's a voiceover, there are, there are shots, it is explaining to you what is happening. You know, their subtitles, their text, it explains to you. You don't, there's no doubt, there's no scope for doubts, right? Everything is explained to you. You're told what you are, what you see, the voiceover tells you what you don't see, for example, as well. The verite style is in a direct opposition to that particular reporting style or television inspired reporting style. And this particular style basically wanted to, you know, give a first hand account of the subject. No para friendly, nothing, remove everything, no voiceover, no music, just the subject. In its true glory, in its most private moments, the camera is rolling all the time. What you see is unedited view of someone's life. That's what the filmmaker is trying to achieve, to bring the realness, to bring the truth into the film. I'm going to show you two scenes, one scene of a film called Salesman. And you know, I call it the fragment of truth. You know, I love this whole point because you know, let me just make this point first before I come back to this this whole uh, slide. So when you're making a film, when you're shooting something, suppose I'm following a subject for like for one month, and and you know, the first few weeks the subject is trying to act and because the camera is rolling and it's not being true, but there are moments, there are moments when you capture the person, the exactly the person, the way it is, like the person is unaware of the camera and you capture those moments and you feel oh my god this is like so real you know i'm capturing emotion which you know uh, uh, you know is it's it's so amazing because it's so real it feels real he's not acting before the camera that's what i'm talking about so i'm going to show you a scene from say, salesman it's a, a film made in 1968 and uh, again in the whole movement of cinema verite uh, this is a story of a few characters who are selling bible Okay, they're going to people's house and selling Bible. And some of them are doing good, some of them are not doing good. Some of them are selling a lot of Bibles, some of them are not selling any Bibles. So it follows those characters across that whole, you know, their, their job in a way. So this is the scene. And let me play. I will jump to a particular scene where I talk about that fragment of real truth. It's at 11.28. So let me just jump to it. Bible for one reason. So you can obviously watch it later, but... Can this I is a scene you? where you know they have just finished the deal and they're going back to a, for lunch. Watch. How did the day go? Did they make enough sales? How is the target coming? The camera is just there, floating around, unaware, catching people's glances. 
Oh, those people are funny. Thinking to themselves. They make a laugh sometimes. They, they, you know, they're so... It's... Is that realism you are now looking at? You think this is real? Oh, this is acting. So he decides to leave. Yeah. He to leave. Yeah, so he decides to leave, and I'm just going to crash out of it. So you know, you saw uh, like a fragment of truth. I, I I I saw this film and was really amazed by which the after a few minutes, after I think ten minutes, you live that character. You live the characters that you identify with. Possible because of smaller cameras. The camera almost becomes hidden. The participants are unaware of the camera's presence. But the question comes, what you see are the scenes where the actor, where the, sorry, the characters are not looking at the camera. They cut it out. Of course, there's editing, right? So after a point, suddenly if the camera looks at the cam, if the character looks at the camera, the director will, will cut it because now the character is aware of the camera, right? So what you see is an edited version, anyways. What you see are conscious actors in their own story. That is why this mode of cinema has been questioned. OK, so let me go back to this slide. I want to talk about Jean Roche approach. He did something more. In Cinema Verite, what he does, the, the directors becomes catalyst in what happens on screen. They actually, in a way, make things happen. So when you're watching a doc, when you're shooting, suppose you're a filmmaker, you're shooting, nothing is happening, you know, just like, you know, they're just talking to each other. Maybe you drop a question, and then you see how the, how the characters react to it. You are, in a way, making things happen, because nothing much was happening. I am, as a filmmaker, is directing my characters to do certain things, which I feel would be interesting to watch. Cinema Verite does that. So that's the difference between Cinema Verite and observational cinema. Direct cinema is where you take into a situation of stress and tension, and you wait for things to happen. In Cinema Verite, you precipitate one, like you make sure that something happens. In direct cinema, the directors aspire to invisibility, like we are not visible. My camera is floating around, and the, the characters are not looking at the camera. In the Verite style, you make the characters an odd, or you made it, make the directors, you make the directors and the actors like an odd participant. Everybody's participating in the film. So the director plays an uninvolved bystander role in direct cinema. In a cinema Verite, the director is the provocateur, like the one who is provocating things to happen. Think about my definition when I mention about and connected to realism and connected to what is real in documentary. Robert Flaherty says, one often has to distort a, distort a thing to catch its true spirit. So it's very interesting, right? Like that thing is happening and you're aiming for a true spirit. You have to like, you know, do things to make sure that you get that you know, <laughs> the true spirit, as I mentioned, you know, the character in its bare human elements. I want to also talk about how television kind of really changed the way documentaries were made, documentaries were produced. When HBO and other big producers of, you know, documentary films come, came into the scene, uh, you know, this whole idea of, you know, pursuit for truth, that didn't become important. That is not important. When commercial interest comes into play, things change, right? Now, documentary in a way exists because of television and big corporations. Because the executives and the producers, they're sensitive to commercial aspects, sensitive to what is uh, going to create political uh, you know, controversies. Maybe that will attract more people to come and watch the film. They're going to be one way pitting one group another against another. Maybe that will bring in interesting you know, uh, people to watch the documentary. And I can tell you, Michael Moore, is one director who actually, I asked this question, if you have ever seen a documentary in a theater, I went and I was so happy to go and watch 
a Michael Moore documentary being streamed in a cinema here in the UAE. And I was overjoyed. I was like, okay, finally, <laughs> a director who is who has some commercial success. And the producers think that people will come because he makes such documentaries which are so controversial. Right? It really, it really um, pushes you to come and see, like, you know, what this is all about. So what, where does this leave you know, the typical insecure <laughs> documentary filmmaker, right? We wait for approval. We wait for the goodwill of television now to, like, you know, I know like from my first early years of my career, I was aiming only for <laughs> funding. And you, know, you have to play within the rule book to make sure that you get funded for a documentary. And that's how you sustain your art. That's how you sustain yourself. So where does this all this pressure, this pressure of being on television, for example, and being a box office hit, for example, does this leave you any scope for exper experimentation? Or you think those people who are experimenting are still in the minority? You know, people are not watching them. People are not really engaging with those documentaries. So documentary has to be seen in the view of a commercial success, right? Because here we are talking about pitching to the masses. We want people to come and watch documentaries. We want people to come and engage with the subject, engage with the topic. And the only way we can do that is by breaking the shackles of the definition of documentary. If we stay within the confines of definition of documentary, we will not hit the masses. And I think that's one aspect to learn from Michael Moore because he kind of really combined a lot of styles of documentary. If you see his documentary, it's difficult to put that in one box. He's trying everything. There are some true spirit, real life moments. There are some lot of very interesting graphics, very good use of music, very good packaging. He uses old film footage and he puts it you know, in, the, in the film. This is a very interesting way of making documentaries, very new way of making documentaries. And that's the reason I think is the reason behind the success. 40 years, right? From the first film, Thin Blue Line, to a series on Wormwood. That's the journey of, of, uh, of, of Errol Morris. This is a trailer from one of his uh, TV series, which is in Netflix. If you ever get to watch it, please watch it. Worth watching it. Just going to show you the style. I mean, you have seen documentaries, right? Where do you place this documentary? What were you told at the time of your father's death? I was told that your father has had an accident. But that was the cover story told by the CIA. And then you have a talking head, as you imagine. My father, Frank back to Olson, the old truth. Was an army scientist. Archive His footage. research group had a relationship with the CIA. Right? They take him to New it's York still a document. Tuesday morning, early Saturday morning, he's dead. What was my father doing? What was the CIA doing? What and let me tell you, the way the interview is conducted, the CIA documents deal with a project code there is a very special Kodra. way of, of, of Errol Morris conducting his unwitting civilian who was given A stylized shooting, big Hollywood actor as the hero on stage tonight. Look at the way it's been shot. <laughs> documents are not shot like this. But Errol Morris makes it a point. My father's death was a mysterious suicide. Okay, I'm going to crash out of the CIA. Sorry for the timing. I have to. 1975. There were a lot of questions so, about the integrity. He says, sorry, let me go back quickly before what he want, want to just summarize. There are a lot of documentary purists who are in love with a handle camera and, you know, trying to be in the middle of the action. But, you know, he questions this whole idea of spontaneity. Right. And that's where he drives all his passion from as far as, you know, his documentaries are concerned. He invented a device called Intratron for all his interviews. OK, so let me explain it to you how, how it works. OK, let me take myself out and I, I'll explain to you. Basically, he invented an uh, entire, you know, uh, device called Intratron. OK. And what the Intratron basically does is it actually, it's like a teleprompter in front of the character. The character can see Errol Morris on the camera. All right. 
the character can see Errol Morris on the camera. Errol Morris is in the same room, maybe sitting in a different area altogether. And he is asking questions to the character. The character can look straight into Errol Morris' eyes. And he can answer the questions that Errol Morris is asking. Okay, So this way, the character is looking at the camera, but actually is looking at the director. Okay, And it's a very, very interesting way, because his interviews, by the way, goes on for hours. His last film, American Dharma, where he is actually interviewing Steve Bannon, you know, the most hated person by the left wing. <laughs> but uh, he, is inter he interviewed him for 13 hours. 13 hours of interview. And now you tell me, in all those interviews, you think you will get to see cinema truth? I think you would. I think you would. That's how the device works that I was explaining to you. The character and the interviewer. OK? They're looking at each other, but they're looking at the camera, actually. You want to see how it works? Just watch this a short clipping from this film called the fog of war. Okay, let me change the slide and I'll come to straight to this particular clip. It's called Fog of War. In that single night, we burned to death. He's looking, he's speaking thousand. straight at you. Japanese civilians he's answering Tokyo, and connecting with the children. audience. Straight looking into the eyes. Are you aware this was going to happen? Typically what happens, the document, the, the character is looking well, off I the was, camera, right? In documentary, what happens? The character is looking off the camera. No, not here. It is such recommended. He's questioning McNamara. This film, by the way, won the Oscars. It's called Fog of War. Talking heads. Just one person talking across the entire film. Beautiful, right? With this whole bombing operations. How he's how to make them more efficient. How he managed to get the reality. Not more efficient in the sense how he managed to go skin deep into that character. The adversary. And that's beauty. So the real genius of Interton, it's like a two-way street, right? The interview is interviewee is talking to the interviewer. And Errol Morris interviews for dozens of hours. So there is no fake intimacy you see in the camera. After what, after 10 minutes, if I talk to you, if you keep looking at if you look look at my face and I keep talking to you, will you think there is a camera? Because you don't see the camera. You see me. I'm the interviewer. I'm interviewing you, for example, through this device. You don't see any camera. You're looking at me. If you use the intraton, then where is the acting before camera? You forget if there's a camera, right? That's the whole idea. So what we see is that when we talk about truth, the claim of the traditional documentary filmmaker is that there is this unmediated truth that is not scripted. Because the material was found in nature, and the text is built out of them, and that is truthful. That is, has been the practice of documentary filmmakers in 1970s. But I feel we need more approaches like 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 by the like done by Errol Morris. I'll give you more examples. So the truth claim is still at the center of all the documentary filmmakers. They take up a historical material. They produce a comprehensive description of what happened in the past. And they try to engage with the audience with that. So what Errol Morris is offering is to break up this comfortable and classic contract that the viewer has with the documentary, that I'm going to get what I'm used to. I'm going to get what documentary pre-offers to me. You break that. And the moment you break that, you have magic. And then documentary filmmaker will not be considered as a poor stepsister to the fiction cinema of entertainment and somehow rated to be inadequate or as a lesser form to the fiction, fiction cinema. And the whole definition of non-fiction also is a problematic term. So if any documentary filmmaker, young filmmakers are, watch, are watching and be a part of this session, you know, I mean, you have to understand that you know, there are obviously interests that you have to serve, cable and networks and television. 
you have to serve, you have to make an entertaining documentary film, but do not be boxed within definitions. And for the hardcore documentary filmmaker, you know, you know the process, like, you know, it's a long, arduous, usually undefined timeline. Like, you know, I know documentary filmmakers who've been shorting, shooting for like six years. The film is still in the making, right? And the whole idea of even getting it into, into a public platform is another struggle altogether, you know? So we have to obviously do both. We have to obviously make cinema that entertains. We have to make cinema for television because that's what is sustaining this medium, by the way. But in between all those, throw in some experiments, throw in something that Errol Morris talks about, redefining the traditional definition of documentary. The sexier the film, the more likely one is to find distribution opportunities, which are far and few in between. I want to close by talking about this film, The Act of Killing by Joshua Oppenheimer. <laughs> this film is based on a genocide that happened in Indonesia. And what, what does it do? Who are his characters? The people who actually did the genocide. He picked up four or five key players who are self-proclaimed killers of thousands and thousands of people. And he goes to them and says, obviously, he's lying. He's saying, I want to make a film which glorifies your act. Okay, he goes and convinces those guys that I'm going to make a fiction film which glorifies your act. So you have to reenact. You become the actors. I will not look for actors. You become their own actors. So they actually reenact all the genocidal. Uh, you know, it's it's it's. I'm laughing, but imagine, imagine. Like you take the you take the culprits who obviously are not culprits in the state of in the eyes of law because the state did not pursue did not even acknowledge that there was a genocide, but they let. So Joshua Oppenheimer goes on a funding spree in Norway, Denmark, England. And by the way, Errol Morris is one of the financiers of this film. And uh, these are reenactments of genocide by actual genociders. Like, look at the irony. This is a scene. Can't, hard to believe, hard to watch, but watch. Mungkin ya banyak antunya, karena di sini tuh banyak manusia yang yang dihabisi, yang mati nggak wajar, resiannya. yang mati yang tidak wajar. Datang sini sehat, sampai di sini dipukul mati. Kalau dulu kita main pukul, pertama itu datang kita main pukul, itu kan darah banyak. Di sini kan, di sini kan darah. He's talking about how to avoid having too Jadi much karena keluar banyak darah itu kan bersihnya kan bau, ya kan. Jadi cara cara untuk jangan keluar darah itu inilah pakai sistem ini, ya. Saya peragakan boleh kan? Boleh ya. Ya itu dua aja sini lah. Mereng sana. And and by the way, by this, I'm going to crash out of it. So this is one aspect, one style. By the way, there are some really stylized scenes. By the way, in this film, really stylized, where he got the camera crew, he got the lighting, and these guys are acting. Like there's a scene of this one person interrogating and hitting the person. It's been shot like a you know. So Joshua Oppenheimer gave this impression to them that he's actually making like a proper feature film. And he's in this comment, he's actually questioning journalism here. Whenever you talk to somebody as a journalist, they stage themselves for you. They think, how did, how do I want to be seen by the world? And when we try to get past that and extract those information, we want to treat them transparently, but we are throwing away a great resource. Because in the moment of someone presenting themselves in that self-consciousness is something also worth exposing, which is what is the image that they have of themselves. And that's interesting because the, the people who are in doing the genocide, they're telling you that how do they want to see themselves? They're trying to work out how people should look at them. And that's how you pitch a documentary to the masses because it's shocking you watch this film it's shocking it, it will shock you 
it will provoke you and he is using every breaking every rule in the book when we talk about definition of documentary in making the documentary it that document is like a mirror to the nation who failed to acknowledge the genocide as as a whole by the way he he there, there is a film after that he made where he made a film from the point of view of the victims and he actually gets one of the person who killed and one of the, one of the families who got who was at the at receiving end and faced them at 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 each other that's his next film that he made after this one the act of killing so you know uh, i will leave this presentation with uh, with part with, with part of that and maybe we can you can also go to slide share where i'll be you know uh, leaving this presentation as a pdf and you can always watch and go through the material i've shared uh, these are all the references that i have used uh, for this particular uh, particular session and um, i have to thank uh, the entire team for making this such a great experience for me um, i loved it because i uh, wanted to come back to this topic and revisit it um, and uh, it's something that i really enjoy doing uh, so thank you so much i hope it was a resourceful session i hope i managed to pique your interest in terms of uh, what you should be expecting when you are studying documentary films or you are or you want to make documentary films so um, with that i conclude the session and i'm um, open for questions and uh, over to you uh, patrulan uh thank you sabir what a lovely session and wonderful session i must say so uh before uh, be, uh, before uh, saying other parts before going to other parts let's uh have a q a session with, uh, with the participants we'll have uh, 10 to 15 minutes for q a sessions so i request all the respected participants if you have the questions instead of uh, sending it in the chat box please uh, open uh, unmute your uh, camera and sound then you can ask the questions good evening uh, this is abhishek bhat thakur uh, so there is one question to sabir hok sir uh, yeah. so uh, you were talking about uh, french director robert uh, parhenetti style so i was not getting exactly what you mean can you just uh, give him brief about his style robert parhenetti so so robert flaherty is regarded to be you know um the first person to devise that particular style what we call as documentary films today obviously it was it was perfected by john uh, gerson so john gerson is regarded to be the father of documentary filmmakers but nanook of the north was regarded to be the first documentary film if you if you go back before documentary film we had actualities so when the lumiere brothers they got their first cinema camera they went out and they recorded actualities which is basically just a shot of something happening but when people wanted to give it a context to give it a background that's when we see this whole troop of documentary film making emerging and what robert flaherty did is actually he in a way started this whole style of what we know as documentary film today the voice over where you're showing an action what we call as a b roll you're showing the person doing certain things there's a voice over which is explaining what what you can see on screen right so this is something which the uh, as a filmmaker also when it, when you making a documentary film i always say go with the robert flaherty style to begin with that's the easiest and the simplest and you will not make any mistake um so that is what we has become in a way the standards of documentary film making as we know today it was something that began with robert flaherty but if you study john gerson and if you know more about what he did to this entire you know uh, form of uh, form of uh, medium uh, documentary then obviously you see a lot of other things also also emerging but you know we take it back to robert flaherty for starting what we know as a documentary thank you sabhi sir yes yes uh, go ahead with the next question which is so you can uh, switch on your camera and unmute yourself unmute your audio then you can go ahead Uh, our uh, uh, sabri has pointed out a beautiful points about the actuality uh, about the nanook of the north and uh, that was the beginning of the uh, documentary film making and how it has been slowly and gradually changed their transformations yeah true yes uh, obisek bhatagru you have uh, asked a very pertinent questions regarding documentary film making so is there anyone who is going to uh, have any questions and query towards our respected uh, dr sabir hok 
so i had a question uh, actually uh, if uh, uh, suppose i am me making a film or uh, documentary film and then uh, how would i be sure that the resources i have collected and the uh, people i have interviewed are true to me i mean uh, whatever i am uh, shooting or whatever i have collected are uh, are the actual truth that right. i one of the show to people how i be sure of myself or my resources sir okay very 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 important question i think that's that is something that plagues every filmmaker you know big or small i'm sure every documentary filmmaker will ask this question at the end of the day have i been truthful okay so let me first like you know like you know take some load off you okay you know you don't have to take so much stress okay which is that if i am making something am i making am, am, do i have to keep thinking about it? that am i doing it right am i choosing something that is true to the self or is it true to the portrayal of the character i am trying to portray always remember what you see is the filmmaker's truth all right it is always the filmmaker's truth there is no objectivity in the world but if you talking about within the realms within the uh, confines of journalism if you talk about journalism if you talk about representing what is real representing what is truthful making sure that you are giving every sides to the story but ultimately at the end of the day you will decide right when you sit down in the editing table you have 3 hours of footage 3 hours of interview you need to cut it down to 30 minutes you have to edit things out and that is something that you have to accept that okay you know what this is not something that i can claim which is i can i cannot claim to be this universal truth that i am portraying So first of all the first thing i would say is do not take so much stress on yourself as a filmmaker and always remember that this is your truth this is your side of story because you are telling it i might take the same subject that you are talking about and you are making a film on and my film might be completely different because that is my side of story so this whole idea of you know that oh you know i am too good and whatever i am doing is the truth and you claim for it that is problematic and you will be called out by scholars you will be called out by filmmakers you will be called out by your colleagues if you come out with that claim but the best you can do is stay within the confines of journalism if you are making a documentary which talks about real people which talk about real issues and i think that's the best way to go ahead that's what i would feel again it is again my my view okay um there are people who might strongly argue that you know there is universal truth that is my truth and you know to- talking about today you know i mean you know if you to talk about today particularly with this whole um polarization that we that we that we see it's even more difficult to claim you know it's so difficult you say something and say that is your facts i have my facts right so that is what that is what i'm trying to say that do not take that pressure it will be too much of a pressure to handle if you come out claiming that you know what this is the only view this is the only way that you can look at this subject and that is my way thank yeah, you sir thank, thank you uh, sir just, uh, the, the question was just put uh, sabir sir has uh, beautifully just pointed out uh, the differences uh, the film makers point of view the film makers uh, truthfulness it cannot be uh, the truthfulness of uh, the audience remember the, at the same time you have to just, uh, you have to know the difference between uh, the reality and the truthfulness about that so you have to uh, go uh, and understand those words while you make the documentary i simply adding that one is i, I think uh, gorop was supposed to ask some uh, questions yes gorop go ahead uh, gorop. hello good evening hi gorop uh, good evening this is gorop gautam from nogao Uh, basically your lecture was uh, totally focused on cinema so uh, just a, just a very basic thing uh, how how what is the basic difference between uh, documentary and fictional film although i mean can documentary can a fictional film be a sort of documentary because if that documentary is based on fiction one and also i mean do you think that documentary film can be uh, more more powerful than fictional hmm. one because fictional is totally fictional it's more of a uh, approach true perspective. true I will actually, I will actually, uh, you know, take uh, some reference to the previous lecture that happened yesterday. So, professor was actually talking about adaptation. 
you know and it is a very interesting topic because he was talking about that the author might claim hey that's my work you can't change it and you see this happening all the time you know you see it is happening authors coming out after the film has been released and say this is not my work but as the professor says in the previous in the previous session you know is that it's my film right so if vishal bharadwaj goes ahead and wants to adapt a story that we all are so familiar with but then you come out of the film and you like oh my god <laughs> this is this is something that i've never imagined right like omkara for example it's a great example you know you'll never forget that film and it will never let you forget the the story it is based on that's how powerful that film is so to answer your question the fiction and non fiction documentary and commercially success film successful film that you see in theaters both sides okay now obviously you know what is the effort for a you know what imagine like if i am a very successful commercial filmmaker what is it something that i want i want my films to be successful to be entertaining but also to be grounded in reality because that's the fun that's the best first thing that you here right the first criticism oh man you for you just leave your brains at home and go and watch this film in the theater that's what you hear right so for a fiction filmmaker that is the what they aspire aspire to be to be taken seriously right that you want to go you want to come and watch a movie in the theater and then please remember this is based on true facts this is based on true events and i want you to feel strongly about what the character is going through because somebody in real life has also experienced that that is the effort of the commercial filmmaker now look at the struggle for a documentary filmmaker the documentary filmmaker is trying to make a film at the same time one it's it to be entertaining enough so that it is so entertaining that you still feel grounded in the story but you still want to be lost in the story because you love the story so much it is so entertaining and the plot devices are so well 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 placed so both sides are trying to aspire for one thing which is the one thing is that they want to aspire to be taken seriously and to be aspiring that people feel that they are talking about some real issues real events real characters a a biopic is a great example you know when you watch when you go and watch uh, milka and you go and watch any other biopic for example what is the effort that with you go and watch dhoni you know so all this is for what they trying to make sure that they try to stay true to the subject stay true to what really happened happened but they have to also compromise in terms of making it entertaining so this compromises is happening from both sides and this is something that is good all right so i would say to i would, I would answer your question in in this manner that both the sides aspire to be taken seriously aspire to be believed at the same time they want to entertain because they want to reach the maximum number of audiences so this is a struggle which might look different from both sides but it's actually the same struggle uh thank you uh next question please am i do that we'll take two or three questions then we'll sure. uh sure hello sir uh yes so when you yes, think know. about making a documentary when you have your uh, subject in mind but you don't know uh, what this what what the structure of the story is going to be so you know the thing that you want to make the documentary about but you don't know how to structure it properly uh so that it can you know uh yeah. you know be impactful so sir sir should we sir like think about the structure before filming or should we you know after right. getting the material very, very very good question i mean uh, this is again um, again there is no right and right and wrong okay i mean uh, you have a great example uh, in this session itself uh, part of the if you see his films uh you know if you see his last film uh, if you have not seen uh, please go and watch but if you see his last film the characters very interesting characters to begin with the first woman uh, music band okay now if if you are a documentary filmmaker and you have a very interesting subject okay and you know that you know this is something which is unique this is something that is um, that people would be at at the very beginning would want to know okay how to want to know more about the character if you have a very strong character driven story so it depends okay so if you want to talk about a, about a, about a, a phenomena a social issue or if it's a character driven documentary if you look at most of the part of those films i i what i can understand is most of them are character driven documentaries so he goes into the you know the very you know the very skin of the character 
and he and he and you you know the story from the character coming to you unedited almost so that is one approach so it depends what your subject is if your subject is about a social issue like for example if you ever get to catch a film watch a film called the corporation it is based on a book okay it's a 3 hour documentary it's in two parts and i'm telling you it will change your view about corporations absolutely the film is so much better in the book so that is based on a book it's based on a um, you know a work of 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 two authors who have studied and researched and that has been represented as a visual form into documentary film so it depends what kind of subject you're choosing if you're choosing a character then your approach is different you have to now look at the character follow the character if you want to have a long interview have multiple interviews and then 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 you see you know how you want to present the character you see if you have the right material to present the character in the right way think of events that you can bring in into the character's life when you're covering the character for next 2 3 months 6 months 1 year whatever that period is and then you try to see if you can find the structure and how you want to tell the story because please remember this is again what i strongly believe in documentary you have to treat documentary like a fiction you have to make sure that you have all the elements of surprise you do not want to give everything about the character in the first 5 minutes you want people to be invested to watch and stay for 20 minutes 25 minutes to watch a documentary you have to actually follow pretty much what you follow as a five part structure five part narrative structure rising action climax uh, denouement everything whatever structure you learn that you apply in a fiction film you have to see if you can apply that in your documentary film as well and that's what i would i feel is the it's is the great uh, process because you are making sure you're making an interesting documentary that what that you want people to watch at the end of the day right you don't you're not making a vanity project that you look at yourself after 10 years and say i have invested 10 years in this documentary and this is something great i have done you don't want to do that so again take your approach based on what is your subject and that's the right way to go uh thank you sir next question please if you have uh, yes sir i have a question uh can i uh indonel okay. yes, uh, yes, hello sir uh so my question is uh so what film genre is the cinematographic uh like combination of documentary and fiction can you please give some notable examples please okay so i think when you talk about what what you are what you what you talking about is basically a uh, uh docu drama you know so if you're looking at a a a a, a film which is, has lots of reenactments and lots of big actors actually acting out some of the scenes and it gives you a better view of what how it happened for example then you know uh, you can definitely look into most of the films done by errol morris um, you have some of the films which have got some great reenactments you have like the wormwood as, as i mentioned it's a it's a feature length it's a, it's a tv series uh, it has got i think around around 7 to 8 episodes it's on netflix um, you have you have um, uh, so drama for example so if you were talking about where you are incorporating some fictional elements for example and the filmmaker is trying to confuse the audience at times because you might see okay it is grounded in real events grounded in real facts what i'm watching is a reenactment so you you have some great filmmakers that you can look into uh, so one of them is definitely michael moore you can look at michael moore films uh, they are a combination of different approaches okay you can look into errol morris there's you know the 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 one person that i i i uh, you know um cannot but have to mention is john gerson if you have to really understand the beginning of documentary and how it led so there is a very interesting documentary by john gerson where he is making a film on post office okay it's a poetry what you see is the entire how mails imagine is making such a boring topic on a post office mails comes mails get separated mails reach people's house how can you make a film on this he writes very lyrical poetry which is very funny to hear when you actually hear and he shows footage it's an amazing approach and like this you will find lots of examples by john gerson that you would love to actually you know uh, understand so you learn a lot you learn how people have tried different creative means to uh, you know there's a film for called kainit kadzi which is just archival footage that's it there's a film called samsara which is only music archival footage and beautiful montage that's a documentary So if you see different variety of these documentaries, you will find a very good eclectic mix 
of style and format and uh, you know filmmakers trying new things and incorporating aspect, aspects of fiction into the very uh, you know the narrative structure of the documentary thank you sir uh, thank you uh, this will be the last question is, is there anyone uh, this will be the last question uh, then we'll end uh, the question answer session yes uh, yes sir, i had a question uh, yes, like there like there was a picture of uh, satsa beran kohen as borat in the presentation so like i wanted to ask uh, how is this style of filming spontaneity and satire unique i mean his methods are quite controversial so there's also a lot of, lot of surprise in it <laughs> i will answer your question by giving a real example so around 2 years back one of my student uh, students wanted to make a mockumentary film okay and it was a mockumentary film on how you know dubai you know you know you know in how the people see dubai for example you know there are a lot of eating joints and people go and eat and you have lots of tv shows national geographic food channel people love to watch hours and hours of uh, you know basic programming on how people are reviewing food and all of that they wanted to make a film which is basically mocking this entire <laughs> this entire body of work right so they called it shawarma and they wanted to eat so shawarma is a very a very very popular dish i'm sure if you have watched avengers you see at the last end of the film they sitting in a shawarma joint and having shawarma so they went to all the shawarma joints in this city in dubai and sharjah and other other emirates and they made a mockumentary film it was very difficult to convince people to let the film actually be made because people <laughs> see irony humor is not something that you know you can digest and if you have, can digest borat you can digest pretty much anything right it is such provoking his films are so much of provocation it provokes people who are watching it it provokes people who are experiencing the film with him at that point so this is something which i absolutely love that particular area of work because it is so unpredictable i think there should there are like boy what borat does is amazing it really shows the irony to us point blank and asks us to negotiate with it as we are experiencing it so i think he is probably <laughs> the best uh, element the best aspect of what, if we can put him in a box called a documentary yeah okay thank you. thank you thank uh, you wind up for the uh, q a session sure sure sure, sure. I really enjoyed so many questions. It is it was really 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 um, uh, really invigorating. So thank you so much for all your questions. Um, it it was a pleasure. Okay, now I I, I would like to uh, request Jinat Majid, a uh, student of Mass Communication Tespo University, to give word of thanks. Yes, please, Jinat Majid. Ah, uh, hello. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. You are. Yeah. You are. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hi everyone and what an event it was uh, it's really great that we had this talk on pitching documentary to the masses and which actually turned out to be very successful i am zinat mazid from the department of mass communication and journalism tejpur university and i'm here to present the vote of thanks to each and every one of you who made this event possible first of all i would like to extend a heartiest thank you note to Dr. Sabir Hawk for sharing his precious time with all of us and enlightening us with knowledge that would be very helpful in the long run. I really love the fact that he had highlighted the difference between reenactments and real life acting and which actually made us question the very perspective of documentary. I also uh, enjoyed the fact that he gave us certain examples and which uh, definitely prepared us for the long run and uh, now i do believe that most of us who are acquainted with uh, this uh, right now can in the future make innovative and groundbreaking works and most importantly i did like the borat reference at the end of it which also happens to be one of my uh, favorite uh, all time uh, documentaries and then uh, i think now that we are more acquainted with all this information it would now be easy for us to uh, pitch a documentary to the masses to a certain extent and i'm also sure that all of us who are here today would be able to take certain pointers and would keep in mind and use it in the future i would also like to extend my thanks 
to Dr. Bharati Bharali from the Department of Communication and Journalism, Guwahati University, for the introductory speech and setting the tone for today's discussion. Using this platform, I would also like to thank Pathajit Borwasa and Dr. Ananya Hilodari Baidu, on the, uh, the founding members of Sunlit Studio Film Club, for organizing this club event. Without their guidance and foresightedness, this event wouldn't even have been possible as it is now. They are definitely the backbone of today's event. Thank you for making it all possible once again. And last, but definitely not the least, I would like to extend my gratitude and regards to the participants from various backgrounds. We have members from different professions in our Sunlit Studio Film Club. We have amongst us professors, veteran filmmakers, uh, journalists, writers, poets, young filmmakers, film scholars, film critics, and of course, students from media and film. And our club members also hail not only from the different parts of our country, but also from abroad like Germany. And actually, this makes it a pleasant uh, set of audience of like-minded individuals who have gathered here for the cause of film. I must say, Sunlit Studio Film Club have got quite the fun and engaging audience. It is actually a pleasure to share this moment with all of you today. Thank you for your attention and interaction. Uh, we are really overwhelmed by your responses and uh, for all, of all the participants today. And I'm really looking forward to having more such sessions in the future. With this, I pass the platform to Patajitta and Dr. Ananya Hiloidari Baidu to formally end today's session by sharing a few lines with us. Over to you, sir. Uh, uh, usually we, we, we uh, hear uh, the word of thanks giving in a very short way. You know? The way uh, Jinnat Majid has given the word of thanks, she has a very promising future, I, I, I'm sure, as a student of mass communications. Anyway, uh, thank you, Jinnat Majid. And it was my pleasure, sir. OK. Uh, I'm very much happy uh, in that sense because it was uh, Dr. Uh, Sabir who first pointed out my uh, my way of making a documentary. He was the first person, maybe because most of them have written about my documentaries, uh, the structures. But uh, he's the first person who has said that Partuta has gone. If you, if uh, the film scholars and researchers have studied closely, they have realized they will realize that I go inside the character. I go inside the character. And that is the point uh, uh, Dr. Sabir Hawk has pointed out. And it, I'm very much touched. It is not because of that particular point that I wanted to hear uh, the way he has started from the very beginning. Because I, 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 I wish I could extend the time from one hour to two hours. I don't, I don't get exhausted at all. As if uh, Bharati so was necessary to just extend the time, extend the time. Yeah, it's, it's so much engrossing and engaging. And uh, finally, uh, we all members of the Sunlit Club and pro all the professors, university professors, uh, veteran filmmakers, and the uh, major students are uh, very much uh, honored that uh, you have spared you, so uh, you have spared your available time out of your busy schedule. And it was really very enlightening and on the full session. But at the same so time, much. we are hopeful that you will be you'll be coming back soon to join us. I will, I will. Definitely, definitely. Please and call me whenever you have anything. It's a wonderful uh, evening Thanks with so you. Much. And I really enjoyed your session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and, pleasure uh, to meet you all. Thank you. Yes. Uh, and now I formally announce that the session has come to an end. Thank you very much. Thank bye you. Bye-bye, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you. I'll text you. Okay.